was in my mid-twenties when I first became a line manager in an organisation. I had a small team of Aboriginal women who I was going to be the team leader for. And I was so super keen to be the best team leader that my team had ever experienced. So, of course, I started reading all the leadership books that I could get my hands on. And then I went to the internet and typed in leading teams and read everything that I could find. I was equipped to lead. One of the ideas I had was to bring along some practices to our Monday morning team meetings. The first one I brought along was called High Low, where you give two examples of something great that happened to you on the weekend and one not so great thing. And I thought being a role model and uh, coaching people through this, I should go first. So I talked about my weekend. And as I turned to pass on to my colleague, she just gave me this look. I'm not talking about my weekend at the team meeting, she said. Well, I was undeterred. I had another idea. And the next week, another and another and another and the next week. And it went on until I myself became completely fatigued and disillusioned by this way of leading teams. I had formed this kind of leader identity that I thought was important for being a team leader, that my organisation expected me to be. But it was actually getting in the way. Our team already had its own shape and rhythm to it. And I was the one, through trying to control it, that was making a big barrier to that communication and connection. Leadership emerges between people. It arises from a need, an opportunity, from a situation. But if we are so wedded to a particular leader identity, we can often miss these moments and get in the way of them. Earlier in my career, I had been a station manager of a community radio station. It was an aspirant station. We were aspiring to be a permanent licensed station. It was called Three Cool and Deadly, based in Melbourne. And I was super keen, of course, to uh, make the best ever program schedule that you had seen. And it was such an exciting time for me working in community with people, thinking about, you know, what were their interests and passions? How were we going to bring this week-long radio programs alive? My job was to not only train people in how to do radio, but to think about what the programs were going to be and who, more importantly, who we were actually talking to, who we were going to reach. What ended up being program was so cool. We had a retro music cooking show. We had a single mother's breakfast show. We had a Koori lesbian talk show. We had an Aboriginal football show and a psychic connection show. Who we are, our identities, and who our colleagues are in all of their diverse and quirky and sometimes resistant ways are important to how we understand the world, how we see the world, how we shape it, and that's important to our leadership work. I was seven when I moved from public education into the Catholic education system, and it really disrupted my sense of identity. In the public system, I was what I would class a very confident little girl very confident. I would be asked to answer questions often in class. I was the lead in two school plays, each year running. I was even selected at one point to be the bus monitor and I was given a pen and paper and a sash to tell the teachers who had been bullies on the bus that day. There was always one particular person that was top of my list. But when I moved into the Catholic system, I felt really different about myself. I got quieter and I just couldn't stand out. I wasn't like the other people, perhaps. I couldn't work it out. Was it because of my socioeconomic background or my cultural identity? Something was different here. I wasn't called upon to answer things. I certainly wasn't called upon to lead. 
Who we are, our identities, matter to the way that people see us and perceive what we can do in the world. People look to us and they think what contribution we can make. And that can limit our possibilities as well. Sometimes we're not aware of the impact that we can have on other people. When I work with Indigenous leaders in Australia, I get told about the crushing expectations and the limiting stereotypes that often render the leadership work that they are doing every day invisible because we're looking at through the goggles of conventional leadership. Sometimes we're not aware of the impact that we have on others just simply by being who we are, that that can inspire others. Aboriginal boxer Lionel Rose said it best when he said, I didn't realise how much of an impact that I had on Aboriginal people until I did a bit of travelling. The way that people would look at me and what I would give to them was real honour. Who we are, our identities, are like bridges into our shared identity communities. We share something together. But it is our individual differences that we bring to our shared communities that can spark moments of innovation and leadership. I was asked to come and be a guest note speaker at the Des Art Art Centre conference in Alice Springs not very long after I finished my PhD. I had spent four years working on a theory of Indigenous arts leadership, having worked with artists across Australia in all different art forms, and I was excited to share what I had learnt. So I went along to the event and the room was packed, much like this evening. And I was very excited and I looked out and there were two really massive tables in front of me. And they were the two major language groups represented here. And there were interpreters at each of the tables. And so I began my talk. And I wouldn't have gotten even five minutes into it when suddenly a hand rose from one of the tables. It was the Pichinjara language group table and the hand was the hand of an elder, an artist, a senior artist and a board member. And he was looking at me. And my heart was racing. Everything stopped in that room at that moment. Now I was trying to be present. I was trying not to let my anxiety run away with me into self-doubt and criticism. But I was certainly feeling like an outsider in that moment despite my shared Aboriginal identity in the room. The elder spoke to the interpreter and it took a bit of time and then she turned to me and I moved in and she said, the gentleman wishes for you to have your talk translated but I need you to slow down. I need you not to race along, please. The gentleman thinks that your talk seems important but it's a bit abstract what you're saying and it's very complex to translate. So please, can you give more examples? What a transformative moment. What happened over the next 45 minutes was a dialogue between me and the audience and the interpreters, and I gave a lot of examples, and a lot of people also gave examples. And we had a look at the theory, and people had ideas, they wanted to get rid of that and add that. Everyone was involved. We were theorising together, and it was extraordinary. What could have been a performance of my expertise, perhaps falling flat on its face and forgotten in a second, became an opportunity for a conversation about who we are and how our identities as Aboriginal people matter to our leadership practice. So I wanted to ask you this evening, 
From where do you practice leadership? From what places? From what groups? From what sources of authority do you practice leadership? The next time you feel that there is this moment arising where you can step forward into leadership, I want you to think about who you are and what you can bring to that moment that is transformative. <laughs>